We are in the midst of a famine, and the most beasts, obese in our society are often the most malnourished. From 1950 to 1990, one in 10 of us, one in 10 of your family members were considered obese. Today is is greater than one in three. I have always been the one in the one in 10. I was born to a big family. I was over 100 pounds at five years old, 200 pounds at 10 years old, and 275 pounds as I graduated high school. I had a grandfather that weighed over 300 pounds during the Great Depression. If there was a famine, we were going to be the last to die. I was never far from society's best efforts of changing this reality. Diet sodas, diet pills from well-meaning doctors, decades of low-fat weight loss programs, and even modern weight loss surgery. So here's what I've discovered on my journey. Eating less and exercising more, what we've all been told to do, creates a starvation and causes the body to survive and adapt in any way possible. The, bo the body will begin to survive by slowing metabolism and increasing hunger, which is exactly what we don't want. In our society, we are profoundly misnourished, if not malnourished, down to the cell, and the most obese are arguably the most malnourished. At the cellular level, our mitochondria are starving. So the mitochondria are the powerhouses of our body. Deep within our cells, these little machines have the ability, if everything is working right and we have plenty of nutrients, to take one dollar of glucose and compound it into potentially $38 of ATP energy gold. ATP is our energy currency. We roughly consume our body weight in ATP molecules every day. So if we don't have enough nutrients, enough B vitamins, iron, CoQ10, the cells may only make $10 worth of ATP, or maybe even only two. So if this happens, the brain freaks out. It has to figure out, how do we run this machine without enough energy? And it begins to adapt. Besides making you very tired, it will start doing things like decreasing the immune system, delaying repair, reducing uh, your metabolism, and even diminishing happiness. See, to your body's survival point of view, happiness is not all that important. We evolved the ability to take a very little bit of glucose and a large amount of plant nutrients and transform them into a remarkable amount of energy. Now, we also became home to a universe of friendly bacteria that worked day and night transforming that plant into an estimated 25% of the critical chemistry our bodies need to survive. So how did we get here? Now, we all have the genetics to survive. Our ancestors survived decades of famine. What did our ancestors eat? Ancient man primarily ate that which didn't run away from him. Plants, lots of plants, occasionally eggs and bugs. Fish were always a relatively easy source of food. And if we had lots of energy or lots of friends, we would hunt. Fast forward to the mid 20th century. Prior to World War II, women spent over two hours a day preparing food for their family. Rosie went out to rivet and did not come back. The family garden began to be replaced by time-saving TV dinners and, and convenience foods. I had the opportunity to visit the American History Museum's food exhibit in Washington, D.C., and specifically, I was going to see Julia Child's kitchen. And as wonderful as that was, what caught my eye was a picture way in the back of the Chrysler minivan. Interestingly, the Chrysler minivan was the first vehicle designed to eat in. So the 1980s brought us the opportunity 
to eat cheap, fast food at every meal, supersized, happy meals. This combined with the sugar industry suppressing their knowledge that, and the knowledge and science that sugar contributed to heart disease, began what I call the snack well revolution. Lots of cheap, convenient, high, high sugar, low nutrient, food-like substances providing us the illusion of nutrition. And the modern famine began. Now at the same time, we have less chemistry and less energy from the mitochondria to run our machine. Modern life requires more and more. Now I love my life, but it's a lot. Business, kids, profession, volunteering, laundry, 16 hour days are often way more comfortable and common than a day at the beach. The really scary part is not only is this crazy pace, modern pace, the accepted norm, it's often culturally demanded. Obesity is the symptom, not the root problem. It is commonly thought that obesity causes diabetes. I would like you to consider that maybe it's the other way around. What if early diabetes is causing obesity? The nutrient-starved cell is telling the liver, make sugar. It's telling the brain, you're hungry, go find food. We grab foods that are high in sugar, low in nutrients, creating a vicious circle of too much sugar in the bloodstream. Now, if you're lucky, you have the genetics to take that sugar out of the bloodstream and store it into fat. If you're not, the sugar remains inside the blood vessel and causes damage, resulting in cardiovascular disease. See, obesity is the body doing exactly what it must do to survive. And that universe of bacteria that is in our guts, they're not happy. See, sugar and gluten feed the toxic bad bacteria, while lack of vegetables and fruit starve the good guys. This combined with the modern use of antibiotics, antibacterials, and artificial sweeteners have decimated what was once a thriving, productive ecosystem. Potentially 25% of the critical chemistries that our bodies need produced by the gut, gone. Now we know this has contributed to obesity, but we're just beginning to grasp the dramatic impact it has had on our overall health. Obesity is not about shame or blame or even personal responsibility. Obesity is about chemistry and culture. Culture drives health, you and I do not. What is culture? Well, consider that culture is the water to the fish. Several years ago, I was watching an Olympics, and a commercial came on, and all I remember hearing was the voice of an Olympian saying, I haven't had dessert in three years. And I was kind of struck by that, and I began to consider what might the life of an Olympian look like? What did they eat? When did they sleep? What did they read? What air did they breathe? Radical but accepted, the culture of an Olympian is carefully crafted to produce a specific goal. I began to consider, well, what's my health culture? What are all the things in my life that press on my physiology to create the health I have? What do I eat? When do I sleep? What do I read? What is my specific health goal? Does the fish know it's in water? We live in a culture that reliably produces disease, reliably produces obesity. 
We live in a culture that blames the individual for being obese while at the same time making it almost impossible to be any other way. It is currently very countercultural and way too difficult to be healthy. Often getting the food right's the easiest part. We have to eat a heck of a lot of the right stuff, primarily plant. Way more difficult is dealing with stress, emotional trauma, or giving ourselves permission to invest the time and effort into our own care. Now, this is not about no stress. From the moment we are welcome into this world, there is stress. If we were a sailboat, stress is the wind that fills the sails. The question is, how do we navigate the winds of life and not sink the sailboat? Well, it helps to know where you're going, to have a destination or a goal, or to know what you want for your health. So I'm an older mom. I have a 13-year-old daughter who loves me dearly and is totally embarrassed by me when I dance. My health goal is to embarrass my daughter at her daughter's wedding by twerking in the middle of the dance floor. <laughs> now, I'm going to be close to 90 years old, and I'm clear I will need muscle and balance to dance, but more importantly, I want the brain health to know that I'm embarrassing her. Okay. This health goal, to vitally participate and my children and grandchildren's lives steers my culture every day. So what is your health goal? Each of us are genetically and miraculously unique, and nobody can know your body or life as well as you. One size fits all recommendations do not work. See, obesity is not the problem or a personal failing. It is a result of our primitive bodies surviving our modern culture. So how do we help our bodies out? So what do you feed your bacteria and mitochondria? How do you get seven servings of vegetables to show up in your crazy modern day? Are you toxic in sugar and insulin? Have you led a life of trauma? Do you feel connected? Do you win at work, or are you perpetually defeated? Each of these questions are the clues that can begin the journey to craft a new culture. What if we all lived in a culture that produced health? What if it were easy to be healthy? So I want each of us to have great lives, and health is foundational to that. The rest of my career as a pharmacist is about assisting you in not needing medications. In order to do that, we must understand our machine. We must optimize our chemistry. And we must craft a new individual culture in order to have the health we want to live the life we want. Thank you.